I'm excited to talk to you because I think you're talking to the world's most worst sleeping pattern person ever. So I'm very excited to be talking to you because you definitely am. <laughs> you're you're talking to me straight after and I haven't even been to bed yet. So this is like perfect to <laughs> oh my goodness be talking to you and that, and that's for like been that's like kind of normal for me, you know. So okay, well then, hopefully this. I podcast feel like that's where we start. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, you know, it will be both um, informational for listeners, but also let's do this as a personal sleep intervention <laughs> right now. Yeah, and I, I promise, it'll help we'll try me a lot with that. anxiety and depression. I'm sure, right? I mean, just yeah, eating everything right. <laughs> Yeah, we know that those two things are um, sleep and mental health are intimately related. Um, in fact, a good example is in the past 20 years, we've not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. So I think sleep has a critical part to play in our mental health. We used to think that it was the psychiatric disorder that was causing the sleep problem. Now we actually think that it's the other way around. It's that when you don't get sufficient sleep, and we've done lots of studies like this, the emotional brain goes awry and it predisposes you into a state of both anxiety and depression. So in other words, yeah. a lack of sleep is a causal factor. Oh, wow. Can I, can I ask you, why is it when, when you're depressed, right? Because I'm somebody that's dealt with depression since I was a kid, right? And my, I think a lot of uh, most people that I talk to about depression, you know, they lock themselves away in a room and they, uh, at least for me as a kid, I, I was a kid that literally sat in the dark, like during the day, had blackout curtains, uh, turn my lights off and I would, I would be able to sleep during the day, sleep during the night. And that was kind of, you know, that's kind of your way out of depression whenever you're depressed i think is is where i would look forward to sleeping i would almost use that like okay that passes the time why do you think that's something that's that people with depression you know that's something that people just tend to kind of go to or how do you get kind of out of that cycle if you're doing that because i've definitely been in that cycle before where like I ha I don't turn the lights on in my room and like right. I've been in my bed like I I can remember a specific time of when I had to have been 14 15 and I was in my in my room lights out you know sleeping majority of the time not wanting to go out why why is that like such a comforting but sad way of I don't know coping yeah, so it is a coping mechanism and it's understandable, but it's detrimental. The reason that it's understandable is that when you are depressed, what you have is a symptom called anhedonia. In other words, you just don't get much pleasure out of life. And more importantly than that, which comes directly onto what you're saying is, you don't want to engage with life. You want to socially withdraw. And the best way to do that is just to sit in the dark in your bed. And that's what a lot of people do with depression. And over the past 10 years in research, we mistreated this. We called it hypersomnia. We thought that people with depression were just sleeping a lot longer. If you look at the data, what's happening is people are staying in bed longer. They're not sleeping longer. Why are they that's staying in I bed do. longer? They're staying in bed longer because they don't want to face the world and they want to stay in bed, and what's problem? And so that's why I say it's understandable, but I also said it's problematic. The reason it's problematic is that we are diurnal creatures, and what I mean by that is we should be awake and exposed to daylight during the day, and we should be asleep at night and exposed to darkness at night. And when you are not getting out during the day and you're not getting daylight, you're brain gets confused. It doesn't know when it's day and night. So it doesn't get the instruction of when you should be sleeping and when you should be awake. So think of it like this beautiful sort of like a peaks and valleys. During the day when you get light exposure, the brain gets light and it shuts off a hormone called melatonin. And that, that shut off of melatonin says, okay, it's daytime. You should be awake. Wake up. 
And then when you get darkness at night, that hormone is released, melatonin, and it says, it's nighttime, it's time to sleep. But if your brain is constantly bathed in light, or sorry, it's when your brain is constantly bathed in darkness and not getting any light during the day, it doesn't know where it is on the 24 hour cycle. So no wonder what happens then is that you kind of nap during the day, you're a little bit sleepy, but you're not really awake. And then at night, you're not really asleep, you're kind of awake because you don't have nice peaks and valleys. So the way to break that cycle is to get out of bed, get light exposure and get social exposure. Right. Yeah. Cause I think, I think my job makes it harder for sure. Because like, yeah, for me, for me, at least, you know, we're up really late and we're in the studio or like a lot of my socializing, right. Is my friends do the same thing. My, my, my boyfriend does the same job. So a lot of, you know, the things that, you know, some people's lives are like, at night and that's kind of for me as an artist my life whenever i'm on the road and everything is at night and and you get your sleep during the day and i think that's where it kind of fuck, fucks with my head a little bit because it's kind of like you know you be alone or you like do this and take the steps but like when you're on tour it's you you stay up really late and then you know oh you got to go do radio press at 6 a.m and you don't right. really get your sleep and i feel like that's what really you know there were multiple reasons why i was very unhealthy un mentally healthy when i was on tour in 2018 but i i definitely feel like rest was one of them because i, I that was something that i was not getting in it's any way yeah, it's so true. I mean, two things that you described there. The first is that you are sleeping against the way Mother Nature designed you. So it took about 3.6 million years to design this sleep cycle in human beings. And then we come along and we think, you know, within the space of five or six years, if we're into a, a different type of a career, that we can train ourselves to sleep at night and then. Uh, sorry, train ourselves to be sleeping during the day and be awake at night and our bodies won't suffer and nothing well, will be a problem. Can you teach this to my boyfriend so that he'll get in a normal, regular sleeping schedule, please? Because yeah. he he needs to get on a sleeping schedule. Well, I, I, he, it's, yeah. it's bad. It's yeah. bad. Well, I, what I would say is that sleep is the single most effective thing you can do to reset your brain and body health. And there is a very simple truth. The shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. So if you're looking for a way to go to an early grave, then neglecting your sleep is a good way to do it. You know, if I asked your boyfriend, you know, do you want a shorter life? And furthermore, do you want a shorter life that it's more likely to be filled with disease and sickness? Of course, he would say, no, I don't want that. And you would not want that for him because he's just yeah, and I'm sitting there like, wait, I don't want that either. Like I don't right. I have this, you know, I have the same exact, you know, issue. It's like I'm texting Lou all the time at what, like three AM mm -hmm. about ideas and oh, stuff. Gosh. And I feel like nine PM. You know, what i said my phone is off at 9 p.m yeah he since i met lou I, he has had his phone off at 9 p.m and um no one knows when she gets the green text i think uh, yeah. as well uh matthew is um i just want to you know reintroduce you to the show i mean in, 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 i followed you for a very long time you have an incredible book why we sleep um and it's kind of a double edged sword for me because i started reading it and at the time i wasn't sleeping very well so it also scared the living shit out of me too. <laughs> to kind of yeah. figure out a way to sleep better in order to, you know, for the health benefits. And, you know, I read spiritual books, which, which you know, tell you why we sleep. But you broke it down so, I mean, scientifically and, and so practically that it's, it's easier to understand. Um, and even back to Noah's, you know, question on, you know, is there, I, I know, you know, back in the day when we used to, you know, live in caves and all these type of things, there was people who used to stay up and watch and there was, uh, and would be awake during the night. I still live in a cave, just so you know. <laughs> and then there would be people during the day who would you know, go out that. and get food and forage and all those type of things. So is there still two set types of people? For example, Noah could be a night owl who's awake during the night 
by design or, or genetics or, or, or a lineage of this history? Or... That was a good question, Lou. This yeah. is why we do this podcast. Because <laughs> I just like, I blab about like my like normal person issues that I feel like everybody's like, yeah, that's what I do. But then Lou comes in real clutch with like, <laughs> answers that I'm like, man, why did I not think of that? No, they're both good because, well, what I, I love, Noah, about you is that, you know, you're just being yourself and you're describing the problems that are real to you. And mental health issues have a desperate stigma to them. And Absolutely. to be open and vulnerable in public and share that is an incredibly powerful gift that you give to others. Thank um, you very much. So I appreciate that. I just want to acknowledge that. But Lou, your question is also a good one. What you're talking about there is something that we call chronotype. That's a fancy scientific name for just simply saying, are you a morning type? Are you an evening type? Or are you somewhere in between? Now, it turns out we understand this scientifically, and it's down to your genetics. You don't get a choice. It's not up to you if you're a morning type or an evening type. Um, it's gifted to you at birth, and you live it throughout your life it's very difficult to turn an evening type into a morning type. In fact, we don't have any good knowledge. Now, to be clear, however, when we look at hunter-gatherer tribes whose way of life hasn't changed for thousands of years, evening types um, are going to bed maybe at 1 a.m., whereas we often think of evening types in Western culture as going to bed at 5 or 6 a.m. So in Western culture, it's still a distortion. That's too far into the future. Because if you think about the term midnight, have you ever thought about what that actually means? Midnight actually means middle of yeah. the night. And it should be for most of us, because when you look at these hunter-gatherer tribes, most of them I go- I shook my head no, like, but I yeah. definitely know what midnight stands <laughs> yeah. for. Right, yeah. <laughs> You're like, do you know what midnight means? I'm like, no, actually, I was thinking you're going to explain some really deep thing. I'm like, is midnight my next tattoo? And you're like, literally middle of the night. <laughs> well, it's middle of the night in terms of your sleep cycle. Because when you look at these, these tribes whose way of life is very naturalistic, they typically go to bed around two hours after sunset, around 9 p.m., and they wake up a little bit before dawn. And so our natural sleep rhythms have been desperately changed by modernity. And so it's not to say that, Noah, you couldn't be an evening type. In fact, I think you probably are a strong evening type. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, please because do. Because this would, this would maybe give you like some little like more insight on me. And this might be bad. And you can tell me if this is bad and if this is part of my depression and if this is just me being what you're explaining to me right now. I am I'm happier going about my quote unquote day at nighttime too. Like I enjoy like evening, like I get excited for it to be evening. And like, that's just kind of like when I feel more like, I don't know, like it takes me a while throughout the day. And I don't know if that is just because of my sleeping schedule, but I've always been, even as a kid, I was going to bed, you know, before school. You're, you're I, I am a <laughs> I am a bat and I just, I don't know. Okay. Is that something, I kind of forget where I was going with that question, but like, I don't know. I kind of just like have always been attracted to nighttime more yeah. so or evening time or, you know, when the sun is setting, that's whenever I'm, you know, at my best outside of the house, like ready to go. The only thing holding me back is like, fucking traffic you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. so i i usually like you know leave my house at the midnight hours um but is that normal like is are there people like that or do you think that is part of my my like is there something like a deeper rooted thing into there that like you know i also i mentioned this a lot in every episode uh you know growing up with body dysmorphia uh, that's something that I've had since I was 11 years old. And I feel like there was a lot of times where I'm not really so much like that anymore. I, I get anxiety about it. You know, I, I, I do a lot of therapy and, you know, I've worked really hard to get through that. 
But I, I, I remember as a kid, like I didn't want to go in no bright rooms. I didn't want to go in anything. Right. It, I wanted, it, you know, I and I feel like that's what almost got me to the point. I don't know. Maybe that's what adapted me to liking nighttime so much where it became kind of almost a bad habit because I would want to be in a dimly lit, lit room because I, I didn't want people looking at right. me because I felt ashamed you yeah. know, I always felt like people were judging, people were always looking, and I, I didn't even want to see myself, you know, because it, body dysmorphia is such a self-hatred disease, uh, self-hating disease. And so, you know, uh, I was just wondering, do you think that comes from such a like a personality trait? Or do you think that because I, I know a lot of people like me that that kind of spark at nighttime, like so I'm right. sure that's a personality thing. But do you think that could also be like a coping mechanism? You know, because like right. I, I I always still you know oh am usually in the dark and like I'm a lot happier nowadays. But I still have my insecurities and like I've always been more comfortable in the evening time in the dark when the lights are off when whatever. And is that like, so, is yeah. it, what is it's that? It's a good question. So I think there's two things going on here. I think the first thing is that you are naturally a night owl. So you are someone who's going to be going to bed later and waking up later. And by the way, this changes across our lifespan. You know, when, when we're young kids, we'll typically be, even if we want to stay up late, we'll typically be going to bed earlier than we would as teenagers or in our 20s. And then as you get older, you start to go back in time. So you, you start to go to bed earlier and earlier. And Lou is a good example of that. Um, but I think something different is also going on here. If I took you out of your environment and we did these studies that we typically do, let's say that for four weeks, I clear out your schedule. You do nothing. You come with me and there's a bunch of other participants, and I take you on a camping trip up in the Rockies. I think what would happen there is that when I dislocated you from all of the different things that I think are forcing you to be awake too late at night, and I would just say, go to bed whenever you want, you know, and I had a little wristwatch that's going to track your sleep. I think over those weeks, gradually, you would start to go to bed earlier and earlier and earlier. And at some point by about two weeks, we would have washed out all of the effects of, um, of modernity. And what would have happened is by week two, I would find where your natural sweet spot is. And my guess is that your natural sweet spot is not how you're sleeping right now. My guess is that your natural sweet spot would probably be you're going to bed around 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And you're going to be waking up around 10 a.m., 11 a.m., something like that. So I think there's two things going That's on. You are when I'm my, no my most normal, honestly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's weird during quarantine. Uh, I just started napping a lot. It didn't matter how much, how much sleep I got at nighttime. Mm -hmm. Like I was just sleeping all the time and that's kind of like carried in to like, I mean, it's still quarantine to me. Like we, we don't, I'm not right. doing anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. It's weird. I've, I feel like I've been overly sleeping a little bit, like, you know, and I feel like, um, I like to talk a lot about my, my mental health, you know, just cause that's, I feel like that's what reaches my, my, my listeners. And, and, you know, that's definitely something people, you know, hear a lot from, from me with this pandemic and, you know, when people should be inside and, and not, it's easy to get into that bad habit of just laying around and sleeping right. and that, that, that starting up your depression and starting up your, you know, um, your triggers, whatever that may be. I saw a lot of people struggling, right. you know, addictions are coming, were coming back. There were a lot of things that quarantine was bringing for people and, um, me being one of them, it definitely, you know, I struggled a lot through quarantine and a lot of it, was that I slept a lot through it. And, you know, I, I had my friends kind of like move into my house during quarantine and it would, we'd wake up around like 11, 12, 4 PM. They would joke around, all right, and it's Noah's nap time. I right. would go to bed till 8 PM, go to bed at 2 AM, 
start all over again. And I was able yeah. to do that every single day. And, you know, we all thought it was so funny, but then whenever I think about it, I'm like, there's no way that that's like, is my body, is, if your body's doing that, is your body just physically exhausted? Are you, are yeah, you? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's probably, again, two things going on here. The first is that you're starting to try and sleep off a debt that you've been accumulating in the weeks before. And quarantine has given yourself the chance to try and take some of that debt back. Now, unfortunately, sleep is not like the bank. You can't accumulate a debt and pay it all off at some later point in time. It doesn't work like that, sadly. However, I think what's also happening is that naps are quite dangerous. Naps can be a double-edged sword. And the way it works is that from the moment that we all woke up, a chemical has been building up in your brain called adenosine, and it's the sleepiness molecule. And the longer that you've been awake, the sleepier that you feel. And then after about 16 hours of being awake, you should be sleepy enough to fall asleep and then stay asleep for eight hours. But what happens is that when we sleep, we remove all of that sleepiness chemical. It's like a pressure valve on a pressure cooker. You just release some of that sleepiness. So why is this relevant to naps? Well, it's relevant to naps because let's say that you woke up at 11, as you mentioned, and you're building up all of this beautiful sleepiness, all of this sleep pressure, but then you take a nap at 4 p.m. and that nap takes away some of that healthy sleepiness. So no wonder right. come 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. you're not tired. Why? Because you don't have enough of that sleepiness still because you took a nap. Right. So the advice is to try and get your sleep schedule right. back into good, healthy conduct. What you need to do is stay away from naps, yeah. stay awake during the day, and then when you're sleepy, get to bed at night and have a good long sleep at night throughout that whole period. That's amazing. So say, for example, um, you know, I have four great night sleeps during the week and then the other three are terrible. Yeah. Um, I guess that relates back to that is, um, so napping during the day, you just basically have to save your whole sleep for the evening. That's right. Yeah. The temptation when you've had a bad night of sleep is to then say, well, I'll wake up maybe a little bit later. That's the first thing not to do. If you're having a bad night of sleep, in fact, the single best piece of advice I can give you for sleep is wake up at the same time of day, no matter what, no matter whether you've had a bad night, no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend, regularity is the best piece of advice I can give you. And the reason is because you have a 24 hour biological clock that sits inside of your brain and it expects regularity and it thrives best under conditions of regularity. So you need to feed it regularity. And one of the things it regulates is the sleep-wake schedule. So you need that. You need regularity. Wake up at the same time of day. But the temptation when you've had a bad night of sleep is not only to wake up later. And if you wake up later, here's the same problem. You're not going to be sleepy until later. So now your bedtime starts to drift forward and forward. The second thing is if you take a nap in the afternoon, all of a sudden you're going to take away some of that sleepiness. And so now after that bad night of sleep, you take a nap in the middle of the day and you're setting yourself up for another bad night of sleep because you haven't allowed yourself to build up that sleepiness. So the rule is regularity. And secondly, no matter what, if you've had a bad night of sleep or uh, it's the weekend, don't nap during the day, build up all of that health, healthy sleepiness. That will give you the best chance for a good night of sleep. Amazing. What about the stages of sleep? I mean, because I've slept and had like super deep and dreamed and, and everything else. And what about like the light sleeps when you're kind of tossing and turning all night? And um, is, what are this, the, the, the stages of sleep, should I say? Yeah, so human beings don't just have one type of sleep. We actually have lots of different types of sleep. And in fact, we have two main types of sleep. One is called non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep for short. The other is called rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, named not after the popular Michael Stipe uh, pop band from the 1980s, <laughs> but it's named after these bizarre rapid eye movements that occur. Now, it's during REM sleep when we dream. So think of REM sleep as dream sleep. And these two types of sleep, non-REM and REM, 
just go on and on in a looped cycle. It's like just like looping a track. And it's a 90 minute cycle. So you have non REM sleep first, and it has light non REM sleep and then deep non REM sleep. So you go into light non REM first, then you go down into deep non REM sleep. That's that really restorative, dreamless sleep, no dreaming. Mm -hmm. And then after about 60 or 70 minutes, you'll start to rise back up and you'll have a short REM sleep period. And then back down into non REM sleep you go, and then back up into REM sleep. And you do that every 90 minutes throughout the night. And it creates this standard 90 minute cycle of sleep. What's different, however, is that you get most of your deep sleep in the first half of the night, and you get most of your REM sleep in the second half of the night. So REM sleep, so in the middle of the night, like I always use my own examples, like whatever, that's usually towards the morning is whenever I get bad dreams. Is that right. part, is that, is that part of REM sleep? That's right. Yeah. So the reason that you probably, if you woke up in the first half of the night, which you I probably only wouldn't remember have much bad dream. dreams. Well, what happens typically is that you actually have lots of different types of dreams, good and bad dreams, but it's the bad dreams that you typically wake up from. And therefore when you're awake during the day and you say, what type of dreams did I have? What you remember are the dreams that woke you up. So if I brought you into my sleep laboratory here at the University of California, Berkeley, and we did a sleep test on you. Um, can we do that? Yeah, yeah. You can come up anytime. As soon as we get social distancing and COVID's done, um, you can come up and we'll wire you up and we can, uh, you can I, sleep in the lab. I have always wanted to do that. Yeah. We can actually even come down to your home and we can wire you up at home. And we can, uh, I can look at all of your electrical brainwave patterns and we can I do wanna a come, I want to come, I want to come to your thing. I want to see it. Like yeah, I've you can never come to been my to my sleep center. Um, I've people... never been to a sleep center, but I've always wanted somebody to hook me up and see what's going on in there while I'm sleeping. Yeah, we can do that. I feel like, we do that all I feel the time. Like a lot of my dreams are dreams of feeling out of control from a situation. Right. Uh, because I, I, I'm one, I think Lou would agree that I'm one to always feel worried that I'm out of control of yeah. my, of, of li my life and situations. Lou, would you agree? That's something I kind of worry about. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And yes. I always bring you back on the path of, you know, again, I don't want to get too, too spiritual in front of a scientist, but, um, <laughs> You know, thoughts, <laughs> feelings, emotions, according to the inside, create your outside exterior to a point where I actually do experiments on a thought and then I would see it in my daily routines. Um, and again, like I want to just dive into this, the, to the dreams and, uh, you know, is there any, can, why do we dream? Yeah. Um, I know spiritually why we dream is, to, is, you know, to connect us to whatever we need to connect to and our whole body regenerates as we sleep. And I, I, I know that I used to think that when I dreamed at night, I was like, oh, great. I've had a great night's sleep. But then during the day, I'd be more tired. Yeah. So, I mean, and it comes back to what you were also saying, Noah. One of the functions of dream sleep, of rapid eye movement sleep, is emotional first aid. REM sleep is a form of overnight therapy. And we know that if you don't get your dream sleep, you're far more likely to be predisposed to psychiatric illness. It's during dream sleep that we take the emotionally difficult experiences that we've had during the day and the brain starts to process them. And it starts to take the sharp edges off those emotional experiences so that when we come back the next day, we don't feel as challenged or as traumatized by those experiences. And so it's not time that heals all wounds. It's time during dream sleep that actually provides you this emotional convalescence. And that's in part why we Makes sense. sometimes of, yeah, these sort of difficult experiences, why sometimes our dreams can be bad. Don't worry about that necessarily. I mean, if it's really causing you problems, we can speak about that. But for the most part, think of dream sleep as a great, it's a form of, of free therapy. And it comes in 90 minute cycles and you don't have to pay. It's democratically available. You just have to put your head on the pillow and it's gifted to you every single night. And you will feel better about those emotional experiences the next day. So that's one of the major functions of dream sleep. Wow. And then, and, and back to the, the kind of 
the dream state. I read somewhere that your brain is more, um, uh, um, there's more brain activity when you're asleep than when you're awake. I mean, can you, is that, <laughs> isn't that interesting? So yeah. when you're in deep non-REM sleep, your brain actually, for the most part, slows down. But what happens is that during deep sleep, you get these huge, big, powerful brain waves because all of a sudden, um, hundreds of thousands of your brain cells all fire together and then go silent together. And it's almost like a crowd at a sports stadium. They all chant and then they go silent and they chant. And it's almost like a mantra. You know, it's all of a sudden, it's like a call and response and it just f comes over. So that's deep sleep. But for the most part, deep sleep is where the brain activity goes all the way down. But during REM sleep, if I bring Noah up to our um, sleep center here at UC Berkeley and we record her dream sleep, it's, and I were to show you her brain activity when she's awake and her brain activity when she's in dream sleep, you could not tell the difference. Wow. And in fact, what we found is that some parts of the brain, particularly the memory centers of the brain and the emotional centers of the brain, are even more active when we're in REM sleep dreaming than when we're awake. Yeah. So it's an incredibly so, active state. Do you find that because I'm, I'm the type of person who lives their life more so in fight or flight mode? No, you will still have that same degree of everyone has that degree of just incredible activity during REM sleep. It, it's this amazing state. I mean, it's a second form of wakefulness. Mm -hmm. but we're just asleep. And in fact, what the reason, by the way, that we don't act out our dreams, even though we're having them, is that your brainstem will paralyze your body during dream sleep. Every time everyone listening to this goes into a dream episode, a REM sleep episode, you are completely paralyzed. You're locked into your own body. And it's a safety mechanism so that your body doesn't act out what your brain is doing so that the mind can dream safely but the brain is incredibly active. Now, if you are having more anxiety dreams, yes, sometimes the fight or flight parts of your nervous system in your body are actually higher, they're ramped up. And we can actually see some of that in your sleep at night. In fact, sleep is a good time to, for us to actually see how, how badly is your body doing in terms of its anxiety. It's an expression, it's a window of expression of, of the body's anxiety. Yeah. There's also something really beautiful that I've found about sleep because like, I feel like when everything is like, feels really, really crazy and like, you know, the worst of the worst shit could be happening to you. There's always that like, it'll be the tiniest bit better in the morning just go to sleep and it, yes. there's always something about the next morning where it's not so hard. Yeah. And, and yeah. I feel like that one night of sleep of just shutting off, like really helps you. And, and, and I feel like that helps a lot with healing. Yeah. It's a beautiful description. I mean, I think it's the reason that we have all of these sayings where people will say, you know, don't worry. Um, it will feel better tomorrow or tomorrow's another day as if there's something that happens within the night in between two days that gives you this emotional benefit, this emotional first aid. And in fact, there's a lovely phrase. There was an American entrepreneur, E. Joseph Kostman, and he said that the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night of sleep. <laughs> and that's exactly what we now see in the scientific evidence. That's amazing. What, um, what about other things like uh, diet? Um, and lack of sleep. I know when I, if I eat a heavy meal and it's say I order food in my sleep. <laughs> no, this isn't an exaggeration. Yeah, some people I, will forget and do things in their sleep that they don't recall, but but there is a very strong link. I post me in my sleep. I yeah. wake up, I smoke a lot of weed though, so that may also be. And we can talk about my... that, which actually suppresses yeah, you your dream sleep. Yeah. So that's no, that's no good. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. So THC, yeah. Alcohol. And let's talk about sort of, um, let's talk about caffeine, alcohol and, and, uh, THC. So THC, unfortunately it helps people quote unquote, fall asleep faster. And that's why a lot of people use it. 
Um, the problem is that it blocks your REM sleep. It decreases the amount of dream sleep. So you're not getting as much of that emotional first aid because the THC is in your system and it's blocking your dream sleep. The same is true for alcohol. Al many people think alcohol, like having a nightcap in the evening, it helps them fall asleep and stay asleep. That's not true. Alcohol is a sedative and sedation is not sleep. But when you have an alcoholic or a couple of drinks in the evening, you're just sedating your brain. You're not going into natural sleep. The second problem with alcohol is that it fragments your sleep. So you wake up many more times throughout the night. You typically don't remember them, but then you wake up the next day and you feel completely unrefreshed and unrestored by your sleep. And then the third problem with alcohol is that it will also block your dream sleep, but it does it by a different chemical mechanism. Um, so I think that's one of the, the dangers with sort of using some of these things. Now, CBD, we just don't have enough evidence on. Um, CBD doesn't seem to have the detrimental um, effects on REM sleep that THC does. So some people are now leaning towards CBD. But in truth, as a scientist looking at the data, we just don't have enough information right now to really understand what's going on there. Um, but sorry, Lou, I, I don't know if I really got to your question, though. Um, no, I was just going to talk about the, the diet and, and like when I eat a heavy meal at night, um, I, I always, I'm always tossing and turning at night. Whereas if I streamline my meal as the last meal, yes, sleep, uh, um, a lot be better, or should I say, and even sometimes, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm obviously with herbal supplements and things like magnesium, if I take, you know, two magnesium of an evening, I am gone and I can stay consistently asleep for, for, I mean, it's only over the last month or so where I've been sleeping and then the baby has woken me up at like 6 a.m. And I'm right. like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. So there's two, actually sleep and diet, it's a two-way street. It's yeah. a, a two-way interaction. So the first thing is if you're eating too late, you typically have disrupted sleep. And what we found is that diets that are high in sugar and processed food and low in fiber typically result in really bad sleep. So diet can affect sleep, but sleep probably even more powerfully affects your diet. So most people will tell you when I'm not getting enough sleep, I kind of, I'm, I'm usually a lot, I'm more hungry and I'm, I usually eat worse foods. This is no coincidence. So when you are not getting sufficient sleep, there are two hormones that control your appetite and they go in the opposite directions that you want. The two hormones are called leptin and ghrelin. Now, they sound like hobbits, but <laughs> trust me, they're not hobbits. They're real. Now, leptin, when it's released by your brain, it tells your body you're full. You're satisfied with your food. You don't want to eat anymore. Ghrelin does the opposite. It's the hunger hormone. And it says, no, 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 no. Even though I know you've just had a meal, you're still hungry. You want to eat more. Now, when you're getting, um, when you're not getting enough sleep, leptin, which is the signal of I'm full, stop eating, that goes down. But ghrelin, the hormone that says I don't think my body hungry, has that. It goes up. I just keep eating. I don't <laughs> think my is, body, my body doesn't have that effect. And this, you know, this could be the what we call the appetite hormone imbalance that happens when you're not getting regular sleep. Um, so we know the evidence for that. Um, yeah, exactly. People just start reaching for you know more food. The problem is when we've done these studies too, it's not just that you start wanting to eat more food, you also want to eat the wrong things. So when you're sleep deprived, yes, you eat more overall, but you start to want to eat more sugary foods and heavy hitting carbohydrates, stodgy carbohydrates. So pizza, pasta, chips, um, snack bars, um, candy. These are the things that your sleep deprived brain goes after. Whereas when you get good sleep, you start reaching out for, you know, leafy greens and some granola and, you know, some eggs in the morning. Some and myself. On right. That. Exactly. Yeah. And so he, he said leafy greens and I started thinking of rolling up a blunt. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about the no. salad I'm going to have off this. <laughs> I'm thinking about the smoothie I'm going to go get. And <laughs> I, go I'm now get understanding so much more about the difference between Lou and Noah. Uh, when we say uh, leafy greens, Noah's all about the salad. Uh, sorry. Noah's all about the blunt and, uh, yeah, Lou is all about the, <laughs> 
the group the early salad. bed, the, the night owl, the yeah, with with the solar opposites. Right. But, one of but, the but certainly there's a very strong link there, yeah. 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 So so how many hours should we be getting? Like consistent yeah. So consistent sleep live a, a, a healthy, decent life. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the recommendation right now is seven to nine hours for the average adult. Um, and there's a range. It's just like calories. You know, I could say for the average, you know, female, it's X number of calories a day. But that's different based on your size and how physically active you are. But somewhere between seven to nine. Once you get below seven hours of sleep, things start to go wrong in the body. Your immune system starts to implode. Your anxiety and depression will start to go up your cardiovascular system starts to go under strain. We start to see higher risk of certain types of cancer, including things such as lung cancer, um, ovarian cancer, as well as um, myoma, uh, myeloma, which is a, uh, a close form of lymphoma. Um, in fact, recently, the World Health Organization, based on this information, decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. Wow. In other words, jobs that can induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. So the answer is that once you drop below seven hours of sleep, it's very difficult to get take any average human being and see them not have some kind of brain or body impairment. And in fact, there's a famous sleep scientist, uh, Tom Roth, who I think once said that the number of people who can survive on less than six hours of sleep without showing any problems rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. Wow. I mean, that's insane. I mean, I, obviously I, I know the health benefits because I, the way I feel and I'm very in touch with the way I feel. Um, I, I, what about like, you know, surgeons? very in touch with the way you feel <laughs> surgeons and pilots and anyone who's kind of, you know, has, you know, someone's life in their hands and yeah, and, how affected are they with lack of sleep? I mean, th there's no sleep test for them when they show up for work and have to right. pain or have to do brain surgery or any of these type of things. Um, there's no test for that for them, right? Yeah, it's shocking, in fact, that the medical industry, which is supposed to be, you know, the, to promote healthcare, unfortunately, we place our young doctors, residents, in a state of total sleep deprivation. Yeah. They have to work these long, grueling hours. And firstly, what we found is that medical residents who are working a 30-hour shift will make 460% more diagnostic errors in the intensive care unit than a well-rested um, uh, resident. Secondly, we know that if you're about to go and have surgery, if your surgeon has slept less than six hours in the previous 24, there is a 170% increased risk of a major surgical error. That's profound. And the frightening thing is that the residents themselves become a part of this problem. Mm -hmm. Because what we've also discovered is that when a, uh, a resident who's worked a 30-hour shift gets back in their car to drive home at the end of their shift, they're 168% more likely to get into a car crash and then end up back in the emergency room where they just came from, but now as a victim rather than as a doctor. So this is lunacy that yeah. this is going on. And we can now see these, these changes. So I feel like now then, if you're going in for surgery, you, can, you should be able to ask your doctor how well- You should be. You yeah, you should, how much sleep, you know, you should be able to get that kind of data because it has a direct impact on the outcome of your surgery. Wow, that's insane. I want, um, uh, yeah, I want wow. to talk about, um, so for, just Einstein, for example, I know he would, um, and this relates back to, to, you know, your book and some of the, 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 um, Ted talks you've done of, you know, the memory side of it. So, you know, Einstein would take power naps during the day, which would be, you know, a few minutes or a succession of minutes. And then we're working on an equation. And then when he would, you wake stole up, my question. I did. <laughs> And when he well, was I was gonna ask, was it was it Einstein that that napped every power nap? It was, it was like actually it was actually Thomas that, Edison. Oh, there we go. Maybe I'm confusing Thomas it. Edison. And yeah, Thomas Edison, equation. who would take a nap every 15 minutes or every well, 20 minutes or something crazy. He wouldn't do it quite that frequently, but what he would do is he would just take these very small naps. 
um, in the afternoon to try and problem solve because one of the other benefits of sleep is creativity. That we often think, well, we have to be sleep deprived to be creative artists. It's the opposite. In fact, your creativity goes down when you're not getting enough sleep and it goes up when you are. And so what he used to do is he used to rest back in his chair and he would have this little system that would wake him up and he would just fall asleep. You know, that kind of sleep onset period where you're just transitioning into sleep and you kind of have these strange little miniature dreams and these little creative periods. Yep. And he would use it to create these sort of genius, what he called the genius gap. And it was this gap of consciousness where you would fall asleep. And he would I call that ideas. pain if you have to wake up from that. And some people call it pain too. Um, but, you know, there's been Keith Richards um, has a lovely line in his um, autobiography about sleep and creativity. Every night he used to go to bed with, well, probably lots of different things. But one of the things he used to go to bed with was a tape recorder and his guitar in his bed. And one morning he woke up and he said he noticed that the tape had run through all the way to the end. So he rewound the tape and he hit play. And he said there in some ghostly vision were the opening chords of Satisfaction, the most um, famous song of the Rolling Stones. And he'd come up with it in a dream. And then he said it was followed by 42 minutes of snoring. <laughs> and then that, that, the tape ran out. But we can see dream-inspired creativity time and time again in artists. Lots wow. of no, you have to fall asleep in front of the piano. Yeah, and then record. Very it. easy for me. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always, I'm always about to fall asleep. It feels like chronic sleep deprivation. We're gonna solve that. Um, I, I always laugh, and I'm like, I feel like I haven't slept since 2013. <laughs> okay, we need. We, we'll continue to speak offline. We'll solve this. I know it's like. Yeah, it's honestly, yeah, no matter what I do, like whenever I'm like really on a schedule and like working a lot, like I feel like I'm like better, but like I've always just been like a sleepy human being. Yeah, yeah and it could just be that, you know, sleep has never been as particularly well structured for you and it's been always difficult to get, perhaps even since as a, as a child. But what we do know is that everybody is capable of healthy sleep, yeah. at least when you're young and healthy. You are capable of a natural, normal sleep pattern. You just have to give yourself the right ability and the right environment to get that sleep. And if you do, sleep will take care of itself. You don't have to worry about sleep. Yeah. But what you can't do is fight sleep by creating a schedule and a lifestyle that fights against sleep because the elastic band of sleep deprivation can stretch only so far before it snaps. Yeah. And it can snap if you all of a sudden go to the doctor and you find a lump somewhere on your body, or it can snap because you have an episode of um, suicide ideation, and you feel like you want to take your own life. And there's a very strong relationship between a lack of sleep and suicidal thoughts, suicide attempt, and tragically suicide completion. So somewhere along the way, a lack of sleep will get you. You can't hide from it. Yeah. Is there any uh, techniques that you, I mean, how well do you sleep? I, I'm, I'm dying to know that. And <laughs> are there any techniques you use that would help anyone to get a good night's sleep? Or is there, I mean, obviously, there's so many different components to actually right. not sleep. So I think there are five things that you can do tonight to start getting better sleep. Mm -hmm. um, number one, we've already spoken about, which is regularity. Um, set a schedule. Don't deviate from it. Have an alarm that is a to-bed alarm and a wake-up alarm. The second thing is get daylight during the day and get darkness at night Make sure you get at least 30 to 40 minutes of daylight before about 2 p.m. if you can. So daylight during the day and then lots of darkness at night. Mm -hmm. The third thing is um, temperature. Your body needs to drop its core temperature by about one degree Celsius or about two to three degrees Fahrenheit to fall asleep. I sleep, sleep pretty asleep. cold. Yeah, so sleeping cold is a good thing, Noah. And oh, if, if okay. when you're in a cold room, you're taking your body in the right direction for good sleep. Your body needs to get cold to fall asleep, and then it needs to stay cold to stay asleep. So cool bedroom temperature around about 68 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal, or about 18 degrees Celsius. That's perfect. That's the magic um, number. And <laughs> That's then, the magic number at my house. 
Um, that's so that is you're dialing that in just perfectly. Um, the other two things, the, the, the next thing is don't stay in bed awake. Um, it, it, one of the big problems is that if you are in bed and you're awake, your brain learns an association, which is that your bedroom is this place of being awake and you need to break that association. Wow. I think you're on mute. Sorry, Noah. Bed is for sleeping. That's Nothing. right. Bed is, bed is right. for sleeping it and romantic activities. It turns into activities. some place that That's you want to hang out in, right? Right. And you shouldn't do that because then all of a sudden your brain, when it gets into bed and you actually want to sleep, it thinks, well, hang on a second. This thing called the bed is this place where I'm awake. Um, so if you're lying in bed awake, get out of bed, do something else. And the analogy here would be, you'd never sit at the dinner table waiting to get hungry. So why would you lie in bed waiting to get sleepy? And the answer is you shouldn't. You should get out of bed, do something different. The so, final two things are alcohol and caffeine. And we've already spoken about those. Um, try to stop caffeine um, at least eight to nine hours before you expect to go to bed. I know that's hard for some people. And then avoid alcohol um, in the evenings um, before bed. Uh, the politically incorrect thing to say. I don't drink be, either. So um, I'm, okay. I'm like off track, but on track. I'm like... Yeah. I do this, I don't do this, I do this, I don't do this. Soda's a no-go for me, alcohol's a no-go for me. That's great, that's great. Yeah. You're doing lots of good things and then maybe some of the regularity, um, you will be perfect and try coming off the THC if you can, um, at <laughs> least before bed and maybe try CBD or something else instead. That can really ah, help your dream sleep. I I'll know. try, I'll try. Um, just a, a couple more questions, Matthew. Um, in terms of like, say, phones or computers or TV, um, how does that adversely affect your sleep? Uh, or is there, should there be a cutoff time? Um, yeah, cutoff point it's, a, before it's a really important point, especially for young people, because our phones are typically a huge trigger of social anxiety and depression. And so, and when you are activated by your phones, you're not going to sleep or you're not gonna sleep well. So there's probably two pieces of advice. Firstly, try to make your bedroom technology free. Try to just leave your phone outside of your room. I know it's hard, give it a try. And then when you wake up in the morning, don't make it the first thing that you do. See if you can just give yourself five minutes. I, all I ask is five minutes. Yeah. You know, Don't check your phone, just brush your teeth, get out of bed, make yourself you know, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever it is. Just give yourself five minutes because otherwise your brain wakes up anticipating this flood of anxiety that comes washing in because the first thing that most people do when they wake up is they reach for their phone, they open it up, and all of these triggers come into our lives. That shouldn't be the way that we expect to wake up. It's not a good way to start your day. And your brain will not sleep as deeply if it's expecting that. It's called anticipatory anxiety. And you should Yeah, you just wake up with straight anxiety. Yeah. And expecting that anxiety, you know it's coming. So try to give yourself the, the compassion, the self-compassion to keep that phone outside of the bedroom and give yourself five to 10 minutes before you check it every day. If you have to bring your phone into the bedroom at night, my typical rule of thumb is that you can only use it standing up. <laughs> you can't use it lying down or sitting down because phones are, the blue light is bad. It blocks the melatonin hormone, which is good for darkness and good for sleep. But phones have another dark side to them, which is that they are activating you and they mask your sleepiness. So you could be lying in bed and if I turned, if there's a power cut and your phone lost charge, you would probably fall asleep. But if you're using your phone, you're just as sleepy. But then all of a sudden, what you find is that that phone is so activating, it keeps you awake. Yep. And so try to, again, just cut down phone use in the last hour before bed if you can. And if you really, really have to take it into the bedroom, you can only use the phone when you're standing up. And after a while, you just get so tired, you put the phone away and you get into bed. Absolutely. I, um, I always put my phone that makes on sense. airplane mode anyway. And then of an evening, say nine o'clock, I, I wear red glasses. And I yeah, blue light blocking glasses. Yeah, yeah. the so yellow or red glasses. Anything is just red. I wear the blue light glasses too. Yeah. 
Yeah, they there's been one study. That's that honestly that why that I keep closing my <laughs> eyes. I have a migraine and I, I when I look at my computer, it gives me migraines and I don't have my glasses with me and I keep closing oh, my eyes because yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. We should let you go and I should probably No, I'm honest, good. Well, no, but, I'm good. I uh, but like it's funny you brought that up because that was something that like my my car was put into a shop and my blue light glasses were in there and it's just funny because like it's totally been giving me migraines and like mm. messing, exactly. fucking me up the whole week. Yeah, yeah they can Im- impact your sleep. Yeah. Um, just, 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 just one more question, Matthew. Um, because as, as yeah. I know, you have to go. Um, um, no, like this one. I know animals dream. You know, we see dogs dream. Um, you know, they're twitching around, all that type of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I know plants. You know, I've read plants dream. Um, all these. Is there any other species that that dream and? I, I mean, this, I'm so fascinated by nature, and yeah, you know, we're all a part of it. We're not dis apart. We're not. We're not separate from it. We just see ourselves. That's right. Yeah. Oh. So what we know is that all mammals, um, with the exception of some aquatic mammals, um, like dolphins, for example, or when sea otters go out into the sea, um, they don't have dream sleep. They don't have REM sleep. But all mammals and all birds, they all have rapid eye movement sleep. Now. Does that mean that just because they have rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep that they dream? Well, the problem is you can't ask them. (laughs) And so we don't know. But what we do know from dogs is that, as you mentioned, as we get older, and particularly in guys, I told you before that when you go into dream sleep, your brain paralyzes your body. So you don't act out your dreams. But as we get older, particularly males, that mechanism of dream sleep paralysis degrades and we start acting out your dreams. And it's a sleep disorder called REM sleep behavioral disorder. Now, it's not limited to humans. Dogs can have that too. And when dogs get older, they can actually lose that paralysis of the body. And they, what do they do? It looks very much like they're acting out dreams. So it's the best evidence that we really have that other animal species actually may dream as well we can't prove it but i think it's reasonable evidence to suggest it absolutely and then um sorry one more because this is uh, while i'm <laughs> right here um I, again i saw your your speech on um ted talks talking and, and, and as a man sorry noah um but you know i read your your speech on testicles and i don't want to get yeah. crass or any of these type of things but you, you know, yeah you, no let's let's speak about that it's one of those other things so it's, it's okay lou i was <laughs> i was texting you about the reason why I was late this morning due to the, that time of the month with lady issues. So we, it's okay. You guys talk your... Well, it's, it's actually relevant be, to both you know what? men and, and women. Um, okay. Because right. what we find is that there's a relationship that the less and less sleep that a man has, on average, the smaller and smaller the testicles become. So if you've got people who kind of have this sleep machismo attitude, who are like like to brag about their sleep, um, you can always mention that to them um, who like to brag about how little sleep that they need, I should say. Um, you can tell them that. The second thing is that if you take a healthy um, young male and you limit them to, let's say, four or five hours of sleep a night for one week, they end up having a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years older than them. In other words, a lack of sleep will drop testosterone in a man as if it's aging you by a decade, which is incredible. But what we've also found is that it's the same thing for females too, not with testosterone, but females also suffer marked disruption in their reproductive hormones and their reproductive fitness when they're not getting sufficient sleep. A good example is um, something called FSH, which is follicular stimulating hormone. It's a critical part of the reproductive system in females. You sleep deprive women, that hormone goes awry and it's very difficult to get pregnant. Wow. We also know that it's more likely that women who are working night shifts and have a disrupted sleep schedule, they have disruptions in their menstrual cycles. It's more likely that they'll have a miscarriage if they're pregnant as well. So all of our hormones become imbalanced, both the reproductive hormones and the appetite hormones as well that we've spoken about. Wow. So, I mean, what I take from that is this: everyone needs to sleep. 
Yeah, there is, there's no single major organ system in the body and there is no operation of the mind that doesn't seem to be impacted by a lack of sleep when you don't get enough or isn't wonderfully enhanced by sleep when you start getting the right amount. Wow. Yeah, because I, I mean, obviously, for me as well, I can feel it in myself that when I get a good night's sleep, my whole body and everything, my liver functions better, my, you know, I go for a run, I'm running better, like all these trickle on effects that are all linked to my sleep. Yeah, I mean, sleep is, you know, it's the Swiss, Swiss army knife of health, you know, whatever ailment that you're facing, it's got a tool in the box. And you should think of sleep not as an optional lifestyle luxury. Sleep is a non-negotiable biological necessity. Yeah. It is your life support system, and it is Mother Nature's best effort yet at immortality. And I think the decimation of sleep throughout industrialized nations, particularly in young adults, is having a catastrophic impact on our health and our wellness. So sleep is the elixir of life. That's, I think, uh, a good way to maybe close. And I should probably go and teach, unfortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get that tattooed. Me too. <laughs> the elixir. Yeah. Right. I'm getting that tattooed. Sleep is the elixir of life.